Welcome back to episode four of Steve Jackson's Sorcery. So we have a choice upon us here, go uphill or go downhill. The last time uh, we got into trouble going downhill, but uh, yeah, so I'm going to go uphill this time. Let's see. The gentle upward slope becomes a steep climb and you are forced to rest several times. So far, you have been walking through the foothills. Now the journey will become more serious. When finally you reach the summit and can look over the low plateau you have crested, you see the path runs through a small settlement of crudely fashioned huts. All right, yeah, they do look quite crudely fashioned, and uh, so the, do the people. Is that a crow hanging from there? Must have done something pretty bad. There are villagers out in the street talking and working. It seems a happy, bustling place. All right, that's what I like to see. Um, let's watch for a while longer. Stay at your vantage point and watch a while longer to see if things change. After a while, you begin to notice something strange about the way the people in the village are moving. First, you notice one is limping, then another. Then you realize they're all shuffling as they move. Some use sticks. One is even crawling. You stay hidden and watch for longer. After a while, you realize that whatever is happening in the village, it is desperate. There is no laughter, no joy. There is no trade or commerce. The women do not walk about the men and do not watch them. It is like a prison camp. Oh, this sounds like bad news. Um, ooh. <laughs> so that'd be the good Samaritan to find out what's going on. I'm not a doctor. I can't help these people. I think I'm going to stay away from this place. I've seen enough. Taken to the low scrub, you walk a quarter cir quarter circle around the village to the far ridge. Looking back, you can now see the village a little closer. There are red crosses marked on some of the doors. It is the sign of the plague. You shudder, thank your spirit, and move on. Oh my gosh, that was a lucky escape. <laughs> I would have got the plague. I would have got the plague. Okay, let's uh, let's carry on, see what we can do. The path turns down a steep scree slope and into some trees. Okay, uh, so does that mean we're going this way? Or are we going this way? I'm guessing it goes going this way, aren't we? Okay, so avoid that village. I decided to go downhill anyway. It's difficult to see the way ahead through the tree line, but you can't see any other alternative, so you keep going and eventually the path bursts out onto a narrow stone ledge. High above, the valley floor. Oh, the ledge leads left and right. There is no way forwards. Looking left, you can see the narrow ledge is formed by a splitting of the rock that leads all the way down to the misty valley floor. If there is a path on the other side, it is not clear from here. Looking right, you are taken aback as out of the mist that fills the valley, an impossibly wide bridge looms into view as if it had only now fallen into place. It is made of planks and thick ropes and is suspended from the peak, from this peak to the peak on the other side. Who could have built such a marvel and how long ago? Let's take a closer look at this bridge. You take a moment more staring at the bridge. It forms a delicate curve across the valley, swaying very slightly in the wandering wind. But the more you look, the more it seems too perfect. Could such a bridge possibly exist? Or is it mere illusion to trick the incautious traveller? Okay, well, we've got 13 of 16 stamina. Perching on the edge of the stone outcrop, you eat a quantity of your cheese and bread and feel a little better for it. Then it is time to move on. Getting to your feet once more, you take a moment to find your balance before moving on one slip here and you'll fall a long way down. Okay... Too perfect. This bridge seems too perfect. Into the valley. The bridge seems untrustworthy. Should anything happen while you are halfway across it, there would be no escape but the last, most final kind. Better to walk. You make your way along the stone ledge. The angle is steep and it's hard going not to stumble. At the valley floor is a dried up river, covered in worn stones, honed by water that is now long gone. 
Small caves open in the rock face nearby, with rusted machinery and ab abandoned outside. There was mining here once, but it must have been a long time ago. A wider track made for carts carrying ore leads up the far slope. You approach the mine entrance. A wet wind greets you from the depths. The mine shaft must lead somewhere, but it is pitch dark. There are no torches and you do not have any light of your own. I am not going to go inside a dark mine with no light. Your breath is short and your heart is hammering as you pause halfway up the valley slope. A small wooden hut is opposite, set a little way back from the path. Let's look at it first. You stop to watch the hut, dropping behind a bush out of sight as you do. After a few minutes you see a troll emerge, ducking to get through the tiny frame of the building. He is clearly guarding something around here, perhaps a mine, or perhaps he was stationed here long ago to guard a city that has now crumbled to ruin. Wait and see what he does. I've got to be cautious here. I have hardly any stuff. I've got I've got no real uh, attributes or equipment going for me. I've got to be cautious. The creature stands outside the hut for a few minutes, looking this way and that, his colossal head turning with the speed and dexterity of a mill wheel. Then he stomps away around the curve of the hill. You probably have a few minutes before he reappears. Yeah, come on, let's have some adventure. You seize the opportunity to race over to the hut to see what you can pilfer. Inside you find it is a barren shack. There is a low oak table in the centre and no windows. There is no door. A pile of blankets in one corner is the only nicety. You lift the corner of a blanket with the tip of your sword and hidden away you find three gold pieces. Most likely the trolls pay for the entire year. You leave the money. The creature is only trying to survive in the world. After all, the creature will be back any moment. You should go. Let's get out of here. You've been here long enough. Quickly, you turn and hurry away, just in time to see the troll returning from its patrol around the edge of the hill. It hasn't seen you and is too stupid to notice anything you might have moved or left out of place. It moves to enter its hut. I think I should have nicked that goal, shouldn't I? <laughs> I'm going to play this a bit more mercenary here. Okay, um, go back to face, no, slip away. With the troll out of sight, you hurry away along the path, not pausing again until the hut is far out of sight. Let's keep on going. There'll be time for fighting at some point, I'm sure. Another hour passes as you finish the climb. With the sun starting to hang heavy in the sky, you reach the top and meet with another end, with the other end of the rope bridge. From this side, it seems perfectly safe. Perhaps you were unwise not to take it. You continue on down the slope as evening draws in. Oh, dear. Some way down the hill, you stop for a rest and sit on a boulder to survey what lies ahead. The path leads downwards, and at its foot, cradled between three peaks, is a village, and quite a large one at that. Behind you, the sun is falling rapidly into the hills. It will be night soon. Your heart swells. A village might mean a chance to restock on provisions. You hop down from the boulder and make your way forward. When an overhanging branch touches your face and you hear a lively chirping. You turn quickly around. Hovering by your shoulder is a small creature the size of a bird. It is childlike but very thin with green skin and it flits around you on transparent wings. It seems friendly enough. It even lands on your shoulder, its tiny clawed toes pinching slightly. Greetings, little creature, and hello to you, the creature replies, chirping. My name is Jan. Hello, Jan. Hmm, NSFW picture. What are you? The creature does a backflip and gives a low bow. I am a Minimite. Pleased to meet you. It reaches out a tiny hand and shakes your earlobe. What can you tell me about the village? You point down the valley. Is it safe? That's Biritanti, and it's very safe. It's the largest village in the whole of the Shamutani Hills. Every traveller who comes this way spends at least one night here, so it's a little expensive, especially for Minimites, but pleasant enough. The creature starts hopping up and down. Come on, it grumbles impatiently. Let's get going, can't we? Uh, what's, what's your game then? 
See that village? The creature replies. The last time I tried to go through, they told me I wasn't welcome, so I wouldn't mind some protection. Well, let's get going then. The creature shakes you by the ear in excitement, and you set off along the path once more. You descend into the bowl of the valley. The hills on either side are toweringly tall and throw the village into deep shadow. It would seem a very gloomy, threatening place, but from the streets come the distant sound of laughter and merriment. That's what we like, laughter and merriment. I could do with some laughter and merriment. You continue along the path. The sounds of festivities grow louder. It's almost spooky here in the shade of the valley, and after so long on the dire road, the people in this village seem to be enjoying themselves. See? The Minimite on your shoulder remarks. I told you it was a happy place. Jan, what's going on? Are they bewitched? Jan shakes his head. No, if there was magic, believe me, I'd know. This is the festival of the young. The festival of the young? Well, take a look. Jan waves a little hand around the village. The idea is that once a year, the children are allowed the freedom of the village. It's a time of great fun and lots of pranks. It becomes quickly obvious what he means. You pass the first few buildings where you find a number of children sitting in the street and drinking ale from deep mugs. Sounds like my hometown a few years ago. Further on, a young boy is holding an old woman over his knee and is spanking her. On the other side of the street, a group of boys is fighting outside a hut with a sign that reads, Glandragger's Tavern. It is all complete mayhem. Yep, sounds like my hometown every weekend. It's probably still like that now, actually. You stride over to the boy intending to rescue the woman, but at the sight of your manor and sword, the boy puts her down and gets to his feet. And what are you about? He demands. I'm the leader of this village for today, and I say, get to bed. <laughs> Is my only choice to strike the child? Well, that's against the rules of the festival. Oh, dear. Just immediately strike the child? I wouldn't do that. You reach out and smack the impertinent boy across the cheek with the back of your hand. The blow is not hard, but he falls backwards into the mud. He is quite clearly enraged and lets up a hollering cry. Suddenly there are a hundred children around you, and not all beggars, but well-fed and armed with sticks and pitchforks. Jan is making a hissing noise in your ear. Better run for it! Swallowing your pride, you r turn and race out of the village. The children follow, standing by the gates and waving their impromptu weapons. Well, Jan sniffs, you're quite the warrior, aren't you? <laughs> Turned tail and ran from a bunch of kids. I think I might want to do that again. I didn't really want to, uh, I didn't really want to, uh, rewind. Jan, what's going on? Uh, enter the festival. You pass the first few buildings where you find a number of children sitting in the street and drinking ale from deep mugs. The young boy is holding a woman over his knee. I uh, will leave her. You consider helping the woman, but there's nothing you can do. It is their festival after all. Yeah, I, I didn't really mean to click that other one. Okay. Woohoo! So I'm not having a good old shindig. Behind the bar, a thick set man is wiping mugs down with an old rag. Greeting, stranger, he calls. I'm Glandragger. Can I be helping you? Hello there. You've come a long way. I'm sure you have. Take a seat. You do, and Jan leaps up and onto the counter. Glandragger seems amused rather than alarmed by the creature. How much is, uh, how much is your ale? Two gold pieces, and it's the finest in town. Well, it's the only ale in town. I make sure of that. Uh, let's buy a mug of ale. I'd like to try the, uh, the local ales when I'm visiting. You put two gold pieces down on the countertop, and Glandragger pulls you a mug of beer. It's warm, frothy, and deeply refreshing. Glandragger smiles. You look like you've been on the road a while. You have no idea. Glandragger nods. Tell me about this village then. Glandragger shrugs. Not much to say. What you see is what you get. This place keeps going because it's the only, it's on the only route between Kari and Kantapani. If one of these mountains falls or the river freezes over, then this place will be a desert in two weeks. Well, I'm headed for Kari myself. Of course you are. Didn't I just tell you that? <laughs> what can you tell me about the place? Ah, Kare. I loved a girl in Kare once. It's the town for love, you know. You have to live every day like it's your last in Kare because the chances are high that it will be. Now there's a city of thieves if ever there was one. I'll survive. Good for you. 
he replies with a nod. I suppose the worst that happened to me there was a broken heart in the end. Glandrugger goes back to wiping down his bar. Then a thought occurs to him. You'll be passing through Torepani, I suppose. The Svins in Torepani are normally a merry lot, but they're pretty depressed at the moment. There was a real gloom about. There's a real gloom about the place. I don't care about their feelings. I'll bear that in mind. Well, what's what's up with them? Oh well, he thinks for a moment, then waves away whatever was on the tip of his tongue. I'm sure it's nothing to concern you. From the counter, Jan issues a loud burp. He has been sipping ale from puddles on the bar top and now is quite drunk. You poke the little creature who clambers boozily up your finger but then topples off onto the floor. Leave him there if you like, Glandragger says. I'll pick him up and put him in a mug. But you don't quite manage it. At the last moment, Jan rouses himself and flies wobblingly back onto your shoulder. I love you, he whispers into his ear. Okay, he's one of those drunks, is he? <laughs> Uh, further into town. Let's do some more exploring in this town. Where's the action? You head out of the tavern and turn a corner to find a group of girls standing by a signpost pointing to the Crystal Waterfall. Oh, that sounds nice. They are tripping up their elders as they pass and giggling. <laughs> you stop by the group and ask them about the waterfall, but they are too distracted by Jan, whom they delight in poking, tickling and generally cooing over. After a few minutes of asking them about the waterfall, you give up and walk away. One of the girls calls, Come back! Another shouts, The water is good for you! Jan sighs, already missing the attention, but comes back to rest on your shoulder. You leave the girls to their snickering. Alright. Uh, let's go and visit this waterfall. Go back past the girls and head up the path that climbs through a crack in the mountainside. Soon the air is filled by thundering. It's quite a climb, but eventually you turn a corner through a narrow cleft in the rock and catch your first glimpse of the tall, natural waterfall plunging down from the cliffs overhead. Large crystal stalactites hang down either side of the water. It is stunning. There is only one path to reach it, winding up the rock face, and it passes by a small hut where a ruffian is collecting money. Hello there, ruffian. You make your way over to the hut. Greetings, you begin. You collect a fee for the waters? I do, sneezes the ruffian. These waters cannot be so healing that he has not caught an awful flu from them. Three gold pieces. Three gold pieces? You shake head. For a bath? That's too much. Yeah, it was cheaper for the beer. The waters are healing, the ruffian explains quickly. They'll do more than make you clean. Well, I'm only down one stamina. I'll give you two. The ruffian considers you for a moment. He seems to be won over by your manner. All right, two gold pieces, but don't tell anyone I did it. Let's go then. You hand over your coins. The ruffian pockets them quickly, scanning the path either side to make sure he hasn't been seen. I think we've been had, haven't we? We'll do him if we have. You head up the waterfall, which cascades forcefully into a deep pool. You strip off your clothes and dive into the pool while Jan flitters through the froth. The cool water is fresh and invigorating, and you feel yourself getting rapidly better. Ooh, I've recovered that one stamina. Was it worth two gold? No, probably not. You feel a huge swell of confidence. Coming here was the best decision you have made. But wait, this water cures disease? Something about that seems terribly important. Uh, yeah, what about those t people who've got the plague? They could do. They could do with this water, couldn't they? People should be told about it. The villagers up on their lonely mountain, ravaged by the plague, they should be brought here. They can be saved. But it is late already. The walk back to the plague village will lose you a day, maybe more. And with this place so close, they must know of it. Perhaps their symptoms are too serious to be to be healed. Uh, you must send someone else. Your mission is too important to risk. Uh, how about Jan? Can Jan go and tell them about that? You know of one good-hearted creature, at least. Jan, you begin. How would you like to be a hero? The creature cocks its head to one side. Not as much as you, I'm thinking. Explain what you should do. There's a village I passed through earlier today, up a mountain top. Those villagers should be brought here to this waterfall, and I want you to do it. The creature narrows its eyes. You mean the plague village? Yes. You're trying to get rid of me. I'm used to that, I expect it, being what I am, but I'm not going anywhere. And the brattish little imp folds his tiny arms and squats down on top of your head, out of sight. 
Hmm. Well, if this village can cure plague, then I have nothing to lose going to the plague village, right? But if the village doesn't cure plague, then I'm walking into death. What about that ruffian? Maybe you can make some money. Gathering your pack, you head quickly back down the path where you find the man outside his little hut. You call to him to come over and he approaches nervously. Problem with the waterfall? Yes, you shake your head. I need your help. The man begins to quietly whimper. Hmm. Talk him into going. Can't make you do this, but if you do it, you'll be saving the lives of men, women and children. The man gulps, then he nods once quickly, perhaps hoping you will not see it. Good. You clap him on the shoulder and he winces. There's a village on a hilltop to the south of Biritani, Biritanti. I need you to go there and lead the people to the waterfall. The plague village. You knew? If you knew, why haven't you brought them to the waterfall already? The only path to the waterfall is through Biritanti. We cannot risk the infection. There is no risk. No harm will come to you or anyone in Biritanti. Lead the sufferers by night and take them the shortest way. But Biritanti agreed. We all agreed it was too dangerous. And what if the waterfall can't cure the plague? Trust me, I know exactly what I'm doing. The man looks into your eyes. He gulps again. It's festival night. I'll wait until everyone's asleep and then I'll go. Trust me. You nod. The man agrees... I'll go and prepare for the journey, he says, and he races off into the dark. Jan is poking you in the shoulder. What's up, mate? I was just thinking, Jan says, are you sure you can trust him? Well, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I've done what I can, haven't I? Jan rolls his eyes. So, so long as you feel like you've done, done some good, that's good enough, is it? And suddenly Jan is off your shoulder and flying a few feet away. He turns to you and folds his arms. I'm going with him to make sure he does what he said. He looks at you, expecting you to argue. Good idea. <laughs> Jan sticks his tongue out at you. I don't need you to tell me that. Then he turns and, with a buzzing sound, flits away into the dark. You are alone once more. The villagers should be in safe hands, but you cannot stay to receive their thanks. It's time to find somewhere to sleep. Which, with luck, you will reach Kare tomorrow. All right, let's find an inn, and then we're going to probably finish up. Well, we've done a good deed, hopefully. Well, I like to think we've done a good deed. You find the village inn, buried under a rocky overhang. The proprietor stands in the doorway, a formidable young girl armed with a baker's paddle. What do you want? She squeaks at you. I would like a uh, room and a bed. Just a bed, thanks. Five gold pieces, she says. Plenty of travellers in Biritanti. We only want the best. Five? Good lord, I should have robbed that troll. Five gold pieces for a bed. That's insane. The girl looks down at you with a severe expression. Four gold pieces, she says. No discounts. It's steep and you're not so hungry anyway. Good grief. You shake your head, that's too much. You run a lovely inn and not a palace. The girl scoffs back at you as you turn and walk out of town. Have I missed my chance to uh, get a bed then? Uh, I wish you could go back because I just wanted to find out about the food. Right, I'm going back because that is redonkulous. Bed please, and I'll pay you stinking five gold pieces. That's insane. Absolutely ridiculous. You pay the girl the five gold pieces and she directs you up a winding set of stairs to a room in the rafters of the house. From here you have a perfect view over the madness in the streets outside. Children are running riot with blazing torches, waving them in the faces of the adults they pass. A few men have their legs and arms tied around fence posts. If this wasn't a festival, it would be a revolution. I'm not going to guard a festival, good grief, I'm not it's that much of a killjoy. But never mind their problems. Pushing a chest in the way of the door to stop anyone coming in, you stretch yourself out on the straw matting. The noise from the streets begins to subside as darkness spreads across the village. And sleep. Your dreams are filled with walking, with peaks and valleys and endless paths. Curious light plays across them, building walls to heights before ruining them as it moves away. The rest of the night passes silently. All right, I think we're going to end it there and come back for episode five. Thanks very much. See you next time. Goodbye.